Well, great. I think we have uh, an evolving quorum. I wanted to uh, wish uh, everybody uh, a happy end of the week and welcome to our, our fifth day of the 2022 Clinical Cardiopulmonary Physiology and for the care of the, the sick newborn. Um, our, our final session has uh, five really world-renowned speakers where we'll be talking about cardiovascular pathologies of the preterm and term infant. Um, my name is Philip Levy. I'm from Boston Children's, and I'll be co-moderating today uh, with Amy uh, Stanford from, from Iowa. And um, we're just kind of jump right into it. Um, there's very few uh, neonatologists that um, you can refer to them by just their first name. Um, I know there's there's LeBron and there's Madonna, but there's also uh, Satyan. Um, and I know that when you pick up a paper and you see a drawing from Satyan, you know the rest of the paper is well written. And we're excited to hear him uh, speak and teach us about acute pulmonary hypertension and neonates physiology at the bedside. Uh, Satyan, take it away. Um, we can see you and let's see if we can see your slides. Okay, give me a second to share my screen. Okay. We can see your slides, take it away. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Thank you for the kind introduction. In the next 20 minutes or so, we will talk about physiology of acute pulmonary hypertension. My main disclosure is that I have absolutely no expertise in echocardiography, so I will have to rely on my co-panelists to answer questions on that particular topic. So when we talk about pulmonary hypertension in the NICU, we're actually dealing with a fairly large spectrum. Here is a baby who has an ECMO cannula in, but before we get there, we typically encounter acute pulmonary hypertension in term or late term units, the classic one being meconium aspiration syndrome. We also see patients with congenital diaphragmatic hernia presenting both with acute and chronic pulmonary hypertension. And then we do see some preterm infants, especially extremely preterm infants present with acute early pulmonary hypertension. In the long run, we also see, are seeing more and more patients survive with BPD and have pulmonary hypertension as well. And more recently, we start seeing more and more cases of pulmonary, pulmonic vein stenosis too. But for the purpose of this next 20 minute talk, I will mainly focus on acute PPHN and we will have more talks on the chronic pulmonary hypertension later in the session. So in the interest of time, I thought I would focus on a few lessons that I learned from my patients. And of course, since I do a lot of physiology work, my labs with PPHN as well. And the lesson number one is that PPHN is not one disease entity. It's a conglomeration of multiple entities as shown in this table. And here I have uh, different types of so-called hypoxemic respiratory failure or pulmonary hypertension on the first row, first column, and what happens to their systemic oxygenation, pulmonary blood flow, pulmonary arterial pressure, and a few comments here. So we have hypoxemic respiratory failure, acute arterial pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary venous hypertension, and then pulmonary hypoperfusion, because flow is really, really important. And that's something that we see in some babies where there may or may not be an elevation in pulmonary arterial pressure, but there is low pulmonary blood flow, and that results in cyanosis as well. So this can coexist with systemic hypoperfusion. So these physiologic descriptions of these entities are slightly different from a group labeling of PPHN or hypoxemic respiratory failure. The reason why this is important is because although most of us think of echocardiography dictating the therapy of patients, that's not really what happens in real life, especially in centers where there is no TN echo easily available. Uh, this is a graph in a paper that uh, Dr. Dilip Bhatt is writing where you see the course of a given day from 8 a.m. to 7 a.m. And the black bars represent when I know, in, in, inhaled nitric oxide is initiated and that happens around the clock all the time. And the white bars represent when echocardiography is done. Of course, echo is done between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. for the most part but I know get started all around the time. So many times echo is not really what decides initiation of therapy for pulmonary hypertension, unfortunately in real life. The other interesting fact is that here is a radar map of how many patients, preterm infants get started on uh, inhaled nitric oxide and what oxygen level it gets started on. So as you can see here, very few patients get started at lower numbers of uh, FiO2 
and majority, close to 70, 80% of patients get started on inhaled nitric oxide when they hit 100% O2. So hypoxemic respiratory failure is what we typically tend to treat as clinicians, whether it's associated with pulmonary hypertension or not. And unfortunately, we use pulmonary vasodilators as therapy here. So it's really important to figure out the physiology before initiating therapy. So a quick review of uh, fetal physiology. Uh, I hate this diagram of fetal circulation mainly because it lumps, it doesn't give enough space to describe what happens to the pulmonary circulation here. So here is a different kind of description where you have the right heart over here, pulmonary artery, alveolus, and the left side of the heart here. And here is the ductus, and here is the PFO. So this is a fetal life when you have high pulmonary arterial pressure, low pulmonary blood flow, high pulmonary vascular resistance, and normal pulmonary capillary bed pressure. So once the baby is born, uh, as we know, the lung starts aerating and the pulmonary blood vessels open up. There's more pulmonary blood flow, left atrial pressure goes up, and now we have low pulmonary arterial pressure, high pulmonary blood flow, low pulmonary vascular resistance, and normal pulmonary capillary bed pressure. This is what is supposed to happen. And the ductus starts shunting um, left to right, and eventually it closes, leading to postnatal pulmonary circulation. On the other hand, when you have acute pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, you may have some lung disease or you may not. And say, for example, you have meconium aspiration syndrome here. You have elevated pulmonary arterial pressure. This is also important because that's what leads to bidirectional or right to left shunts at the PFO level and also at the ductal level. And so now you see low pulmonary blood flow, high pressure, and hopefully the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is normal in this particular case. But as time goes on, this ductus, which acts as a pop-off valve in the first day or two, tends to close off. And once that closes off, there's a lot more stress on the right ventricle, and that results in right ventricular hypertrophy and eventually failure, uh, leading on to the need for ECMO. Similarly, you also have pulmonary venous hypertension, which can be due to pulmonary vein stenosis or left ventricular dysfunction, in which there is already interstitial pulmonary edema. And when you add a vasodilator on the top of it, things really don't go well. Here, the main reason why pulmonary arterial pressure goes up is because pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in the post capillary area is high. And that's the reason for backup uh, pressure. But the important thing to remember is that there is already some interstitial pulmonary edema here. And giving an inhaled vasodilator can complicate things in this particular condition. So given this varied appearance, it's really important to get an X-ray and figure out what you're dealing with. And if you have mainly parenchymal lung disease, as shown here, there is significant parenchymal loss. Early surfactant therapy and increase in mean airway pressure to open up the lung is really important. So in these cases, the strategy is lung recruitment. And so we should say no to peepophobia or mapophobia. We need to use whatever mean airway pressure or peep that you need to open up this lung and use surfactant if needed, because that's the main thing that you need to do. If you don't do that, your inhaled vasodilators and oxygen can't reach the target vessel, which is the pulmonary arteriole. On the other hand, if you have idiopathic black lung PPHN without parenchymal lung disease, the focus should be on optimal expansion, but not really lung using a lung uh, ex ex excessive PEEP. And similarly, if you have oligohydramnios and pulmonary hyperplasia or CDH, then you should be really careful and you should use a lung protective strategy in these particular cases. And you should really be careful about expanding the lung and avoiding volume trauma. So optimal PEEP is important when you're dealing with any conditions such as meconium aspiration syndrome, because if there is expiratory air obstruction, then that prevents the air from going out and using adequate PEEP will open up the airway here as well. So decide which kind of lung disease you have causing pulmonary hypertension and choose the optimal therapy for ventilation. So let's briefly talk about oxygen. As many of you are aware, there are lots of guidelines suggesting how much oxygen we should use. The most common one currently used is the European Pulmonary Vascular Disease Network guidelines, where a range between, preductal range between 91 to 95% is what is recommended when PPHN is suspected or established. But just to let you know, there is not a single clinical trial um, suggesting where, what O2 should, we should use in PPHN, especially in term infants. This is all based on animal studies or somebody's expert opinion. So that brings us to an interesting question. For example, if you have a baby with meconium aspiration syndrome and hypoxemic respiratory failure, this kid is on a conventional ventilator with 90% oxygen and has a really low PaO2 of 35. 
and the oxygenation index based on this gas is 31. Uh, but when you look at the baby, this is a gas coming from the umbilical artery. So the baby has a preductal sat of 93 and a postductal sat of 75. So what should you do first? The main thing that I do is to defend yourself as to why you, you are focusing on preductal sat. So I usually write a note in the chart stating that the baby has hypoxemic respiratory failure, has stable preductal sats, the lactic acid is okay, the urine output is okay, there's no metabolic acidosis. So this is what is dictating my therapy and not the low PaO2 in the umbilical artery. And I often use a formula that's, uh, uh, that's uh, been made available to us by Muni Raman and his colleagues, where there's a, we can convert the preductal SATs, OSI, into an approximate OI. For example, in this particular case, with a SAT of 93%, the oxygenation index is calculated to be 21, which is much lower than the 31 seen based on the UA gas. So be careful if you're not dictating, directing your therapy based on umbilical arterial lines, write something in the chart to mention as to why you're using a preductal SAT for that particular purpose. So again, why do we focus on preductal SATs? Because the brain and the heart are both preductal. And so that's the area that we really need to focus on. There are some guidelines, especially the management of CDH that suggest that uh, preductal SATs of 85 to 95 and postructal SATs of above 70 are adequate. But when you deal with PPHN due to other causes, I tend to be a bit more cautious, and I would like to use postrectal SATs of at least around 80 plus and preductal SATs in the 90 to 98% range, as long as lactate is normal and the urine output is adequate. One other thing that really helps you in many of these situations is NIRS. Having an NIRS probe on the, in the cerebral area and the somatic area is very helpful, because if these numbers are going down, that might suggest inadequate oxygenation as well. And you need to look at as to why that is happening. So uh, when I think of NIRS, this curve comes to mind, as many of you are familiar, here is oxygen delivery on the horizontal axis, oxygen consumption on the vertical axis. And uh, as you start going down this path, you tend to come close to this critical point below which delivery of oxygen dictates oxygen consumption. And you really don't want to have any patient below this critical point. So the main thing to remember here is that it's not just the SpO2 that matters, blood flow and hemoglobin both really, really matter. So it's important to maintain reasonable hemoglobin. I like my hemoglobins at least 11 or 12 or higher in that range. I don't like babies when they have hemoglobin below 10 because it's a main thing that carries oxygen as well. At the same token, if your NIRS values, especially the cerebral values are starting to fall, that means that you, the, your patient is starting to move further and further towards the critical point. And so a falling NIRS, an increasing lactate, all of these are bad signs and you should provide adequate oxygen, either by increasing SiO2 or hemoglobin or flow, one of these three parameters. So it's import, also important to remember that uh, blue blood is better than no blood. Of course, we like all our intestines to look like this, but if they look like this with blue blood but have adequate flow, that's better than having no blood at all because ischemia is a bigger deal to deal with than just cyanosis. So if there's adequate blood flowing to a tissue, even if the PO2 is a little low, that's okay than having no blood flow to the organ at all. And that's really important. Again, going back to PAO2, uh, there are very few really classic animal studies done by Abe Rudolph and his colleagues more than 50 years ago very clearly showed that maintaining PAO2 below 45 to 50 is not good, and maintaining them between 50 and 70 or 50 or, and 80 is probably the right thing to do. But at the same token, avoiding hyperoxia with PAO2 values above 120 is also important because normoxia causes pulmonary vasodilation, but hyperoxia does not cause any additional pulmonary vasodilation. And animal studies from our lab have clearly shown that even 30 minutes of 100% O2 is adequate to light up the pulmonary arteries and airways with superoxide anions. The red stain that you see here is superoxide anions. So you, you just need a few minutes of 100% O2 to cause oxygen toxicity in the lung. So since we don't use PAO2s very often, what do we use when we do SATs? Here are close to more than 100 animal studies in various kinds of lamps, and they all show virtually the same thing. If you maintain SATs between 90 to 98%, the PVR is relatively low. And if you mix, drop the SATs into the 80s and 70s, then you can see a huge increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. But it's not that easy because the main site that determines 
pulmonary vascular resistance is the pre-capillary pulmonary arteriole. That's the site of pulmonary vascular resistance. And the PaO2 that this particular vessel sees is mainly dictated by the alveolar O2 or the P uppercase A O2 for two thirds of extent. The other one third is dictated by the pulmonary arterial PV O2. So it's not only important to maintain adequate systemic oxygenation, but it's important to provide adequate FiO2 and maintain appropriate alveolar oxygenation as well, because that's an important determinant of pulmonary vascular resistance in, in uh, humans. The second thing to remember is that it's not just hyperoxia that causes oxygen, oxidative stress, even hypoxia causes oxidative stress. The unique feature of acute pulmonary hypertension in neonates is that you have a combination of alveolar hyperoxia with systemic hypoxia. So these two, both of these cause oxygen toxicity, and it's important to avoid both hypoxia and hyperoxia when you manage babies with pulmonary hypertension. So Another point as to why it's important to think of SpO2, PaO2, and FiO2. If you, for example, if you have a baby with pulmonary hypertension whose SATs are 90% pre-rectal, post-rectal is 70%, and the baby is only saturating around 90, 30, or is, is only requiring 30% FiO2, in these cases, it's probably appropriate to increase the inspired oxygen to around 45% and target pre-rectal SATs in the 93 range and post-rectal in the 80 range. The reason for that is that in this particular case, the risk of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction due to low PaO2 is much higher than the oxygen toxicity to the lung because the O2 here is only 30%. You, you can afford to go up to around 45%. On the other hand, if you have another baby with PPHN whose predictal SATs are the same 90%, but the lactate is normal and no acidosis, and the FiO2 is already 80%, if the FiO2 is this high, it doesn't make any sense in this case to increase the FiO2 further from 80%, and we should just closely monitor pH, lactate, and urine output, because in this case, the risk of oxygen toxicity, because the baby is already on 80%, outweighs the risk of pulmonary vasoconstriction. So there's no fixed guideline for babies. It changes with each baby, and you have to monitor each baby and dictate what's the optimal guideline for the optimal saturation range for that particular baby. So again, I really like to call this sexagen T4 view of the period of 60. So anytime you turn the dial on FiO2 above 60%, think twice as to what you're doing, because if the FiO2 is less than 0.6, try to maintain the SATs in the mid, mid, low to mid 90s. On the other hand, if the FiO2 is more than 60% already, then it's probably okay to maintain the SATs in the low 90s, as long as you're watching near infrared spectroscopy, lactate, and urine output. Again, Low O2 is a vasodilator, but if you give too much of oxygen, you create superoxide anions that can combine with nitric oxide. And this is where the marriage between nitric oxide and oxygen does not go well because they can both form peroxynitrate, which is a toxic compound and cause vasoconstriction. The second thing to pay attention to is baby's acidosis because PaO2, the optimal PaO2 for ensuring pulmonary vasodilation changes with pH. Again, a classic figure from Dr. Rudolph where he has shown that when the pH is low, the change point at which the PVR increases, this is the PaO2, is around 55 millimeters of mercury. On the other hand, if you become less acidotic, this number goes lower and lower. And as you can see here, if the pH is totally normal, the, PAO, the P change point for PVR is much lower. So babies can tolerate a bit of hypoxemia if their pH is, is high. On the other hand, the presence of acidosis tends to make things worse. So acidosis exacerbates hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, and you should be careful when you have acidosis. You should not have hypoxemia. Similarly, more recently, studies have come out showing that in African-American infants, things are different. And here is a study where they defined occult hypoxemia as a situation where the SpO2, the pulse ox, is reading a normal number, but the ABG, when you do a coaximetry SAO2, that number is less. So such occult hypoxemia is much more common among black infants. For example, if you're targeting a SAT of 892 to 96, the incidence of occult hypoxemia is 29.3% in black infants, but only 13.4% in white infants. So it appears as though skin pigmentation may have an impact on this as well. So in these situations, one should be careful about targeting really low 90s while managing babies with PPHN. The third instance is uh, hypothermia. 
Many of you are aware that the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve shifts to the left. Here is some data from Dr. Bushra Afsal. Uh, she showed that with hypothermia, the shift in oxygen dissociation curve leads to a situation where maintaining the same PaO2 requires higher SATs when you're hypothermic. So for example, if you want to target a PaO2 of 50 to 70, SATs in the low 90s are adequate when you're normothermic but SATs in the high 90s are needed when you're hypothermic. So this shift also matters. So you need to take that into consideration as well. More recently, we have done some LAMP studies where we have targeted LAMPs to have either SpO2 of 91 to 95 or 95 to 98. And as you can see, we got good separation in SpO2, good separation in FiO2, good separation in PaO2. But what's interesting is that when you compare these two SAT ranges, when the lamps are normothermic, there is no difference in pulmonary blood flow at all. But when you start making these lamps hypothermic with therapeutic hypothermia, then you start seeing a drop in pulmonary blood flow in the presence of hypoxemia or lower oxygen sat. So a combination of hypoxemia and hypothermia can cause more problems with increased pulmonary vasoconstriction. So um, as summarized in this figure, during therapeutic hypothermia, there is increased risk of high pulmonary vascular resistance, there is cardiac dysfunction secondary to HIE, there might be renal compromise and poor clearance of medications, and all of these can contribute to increase, uh, uh, increased incidence of uh, PPHN during hypothermia. So here is some data to show that during hypothermia, most centers tend to maintain reasonably high PAO2 levels, and that might be a reason why uh, we don't see a difference in PPHN in randomized trials, but in real life, there's a higher incidence of PPHN with therapeutic hypothermia. I'll skip this in the interest of time uh, and just conclude with this slide. So although we typically think of meconium aspiration syndrome to be a relatively mild disease that has low mortality and low need for ECMO, 3.9% plus 2.2%, when you combine meconium aspiration syndrome with HIE and hypothermia, then the need for inhaled NO becomes significantly higher, the need for ECMO goes up quite a bit, and the mortality goes up quite a bit. So meconium aspiration syndrome without HIE is a very different entity from meconium aspiration, which is combined with HIE and hypothermia, and that's something we need to be careful about. I thank you for your attention, and I want to conclude by saying that every baby with pulmonary hypertension should be managed with precision medicine. Each baby has unique physiology, and within each baby, the pathophysiology changes with time, so careful attention to physiology is very important, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Satyan. Uh... Awesome as always, uh, extremely informative, uh, and I'm 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 really excited uh, to take the transition from the work that Satyan has done to our next speaker, uh, Jean Dempsey, uh, who is a neonatologist uh, in Ireland, who is going to be speaking to us about uh, transitional hypotension and sharing uh, his insights from the last five, ten, and fifteen years. Uh, take it away, Jean. Great, we can see your slides, Jean. You, you might just have to unmute yourself, Jean. Can you see me? Look. Yeah, I can see you, Gene, and your slides look like they're a little stalled out there. Now we can see your slides. Apologies. And can you see and hear me? <laughs> yeah, perfect. All great, Gene. Take it away. Fantastic. Apologies. Um, I don't uh, have anything to disclose. Um, and needless to say, you won't be surprised. We will be discussing uh, or mention at least uh, off-label inotropes uh, and vasopressors and inodilators over the course of the next 20 minutes or so. But I guess the, the critical things I'd like people to think about as we work our way through the uh, next 15 minutes or so is that when we think of adaptation, the cardiovascular system really is poorly equipped to deal with extra uterine existence. And we need to stop equating flow with pressure. I think that's a really important thing, and, and we still continue to do it every day in the, in, the in the intensive care unit. 
And I guess uh, another factor we need to consider is that interventions that we uh, uh, initiate have variable effects and they may in fact be detrimental. So it is a relatively unique phenomenon. I don't need to tell anybody uh, on today's call um, uh, how unique it is. We have intracardiac and extracardiac shunts that are not necessarily uh, present in older kids and, and adults who may have uh, hypertension related issues. And, and the system itself overall is structurally, metabolically, and functionally very, very uh, different. And without laboring the point, because I'm sure you've discussed this earlier on in the week, the, the neonatal myocardium has a lot more fibrous uh, non-contractile tissue. It has markedly decreased sympathetic innervation and fewer adrenal receptors, and the immature myocardium is much more sensitive to afterload. And for those of you who work between neonatal intensive care units and uh, pediatric intensive care units, you're very familiar with the fact that the, the sort of doses of, of agents that you're giving are almost half that in a, say, a one-year-old or a two-year-old, and much of that relates to the decreased sympathetic uh, innervation and, and the fact that there are fewer adrenal receptors. And I guess one thing that we uh, need to always consider is that, you know, a, a goal-directed therapy to increase your blood pressure doesn't necessarily relate to your, a goal-directed uh, approach to increase end-organ blood flow. And too often we think of hypotension and we don't really think of the concept of low flow states. And uh, I think some of the reason behind that is because we can't reliably or readily measure blood flow continuously in the neonatal intensive care unit. And historically, low blood pressure is associated with uh, adverse short and long-term outcome. We have so many studies highlighting uh, the, the association between low BP and adverse outcome. And when you uh, look at, at various different publications, whether they be uh, trials or whether they be unit practices, et cetera, it always amazes me. You know, some up to half of the babies delivered less than 28 weeks receive inotrope. I, I find that a, a very staggering figure. And I guess you, know, you will come across uh, manuscripts highlighting that treatment of low blood pressure is associated with adverse outcome and treatment of low blood pressure is associated with improved outcome. And all of these, all of these are, if you will, um, characterized by the word associated with. And that's something that I think we need to try and uh, uh, tease out a bit more and get a better understanding of. And, and hopefully at the end of this presentation, I'll have confused everybody enough to uh, ask you all to go back and think about this problem and maybe look at, at uh, interventions within your own intensive care unit. I think the important thing in terms of inotropes and their administration, you know, there's, there isn't a really consistent relationship between plasma catecholamine levels and target and target organ effects. The responses are variable. Uh, the doses are, are somewhat, or dose responses are somewhat unpredictable really. And doses need to be tailored carefully and, uh, and uh, individualized. I put down mechanical ventilation here as well, because that's a common intervention that we use in the neonatal intensive care unit. And I guess one that we don't uh, uh, consider too much the potential impacts of. When we look at, at studies of blood pressure support, the last time I looked at this, there were somewhere in the region of 24 RCTs, uh, mainly single site studies, all of them characterized by small numbers of enrolled patients and really limited data on clinically relevant uh, outcomes. I mean, uh, being flippant about it, if you, if you were to condense down all the data, what we can say for certain is that dopamine probably increases your blood pressure uh, um, uh, more than placebo. Um, and, and then you have variable studies with different comparisons with different agents uh, suggesting variable effects on some short-term parameters, but none of them are powered for clinically relevant um, endpoints. I mentioned mechanical ventilation. Well, you know, this is some nice work from the neonatal intensive care unit and the PICU on the potential adverse effect of mechanical ventilation. And the, the graph on the left of the screen, figure on the left, is that from Nick Evans' uh, group looking at the impact of alterations in PEEP and the potential impact on SVC flow. And the middle graph, the impact of alterations in um, PEEP and uh, its impact on stroke volume. 
So you see a, a, an increase when the map is decreased and an increase, sorry, an increase in a reduction in stroke volume when the mean airway pressure is um, increased. And all of these relate to the impact on preload, contractility, and, and afterload. Things that we really need to think about in a great deal more uh, detail. And we have lots of, of um, uh, human data, uh, for example, the AMV trial, avoidance of mechanical ventilation trial, showing a reduction in the inotrope use in those who uh, uh, avoided mechanical ventilation. But I guess for now, we tend to focus our care on blood pressure values at the bedside. And it's really important to uh, consider all these other variables that I've listed here when one is making a, a decision around whether to intervene or not. Um, but blood pressure ranges are many, often retrospectively collected data on a small number of patients, often only a, a few data points summated over, over a period of time, and in instances combined invasive and non-invasive measures. And what always struck me was, you know, the inclusion of babies on inotropes in normative blood pressure ranges. I find that uh, rather um, silly, to say the least. But there are, I suppose, some common uh, ranges that are used or definitions that are used. And probably the, the ones that stick in my mind the most and, and are probably commonly used are mean, airway, or mean arterial pressure less than the equivalent gestational age, or indeed a solitary value of, of less than 30 millimeters of mercury. But when you stop and think about this, I think the one thing or two things perhaps that we don't give enough consideration to are the duration of time that one is talking about, and also, if you will, the deviation from this, uh, no, I, I say norm, but in essence, you know, is 22 millimeters of mercury uh, acceptable for a baby who is 24 weeks for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours? When should one consider intervening or not? And these are questions really that we don't have any definitive answers to to date. What we do have is some nice data showing that the blood pressure typically increases over the first 24 hours of life. And that increase from Bull Batten's work suggested an increase somewhere in the region of about five millimeters of mercury over that 24 hour window. Just highlighting the dynamic nature of blood pressure change and not a stagnant solitary value over the first 72 hours or over the first week of life as may be the case uh, in some uh, cases. How common is the problem? Well, it, again, it's variable depending on the definition that's used. But for here, for the Canadian neonatal network and for the German neonatal network uh, and for the um, NICHD trial using the gestational age less than uh, the equivalent, um, is that, sorry, blood pressure less than the equivalent gestational age, somewhere around th a third to half the babies having uh, a definition of low blood pressure. In our own trial, a number of years back, uh, there was approximately 800 babies delivered within the timeline of the study. 200 of them had a numerically low blood pressure, less than their equivalent gestational age. Approximately one in four uh, babies having uh, uh, a low blood pressure. And these are uh, important things to consider. If you have different thresholds for intervening, then you're probably going to result in having different uh, percentage of babies receiving inotrope or not. And this is a study from uh, the UK, a pilot trial, where they looked at different thresholds, the thresholds being what they defined as active, maintaining a blood pressure above 30, moderate was less than the gestational age, and permissive was with uh, signs of poor perfusion or an absolute mean blood pressure value less than 19. And if you look again at, across the three groups, the inotrope use was greater than those with the active arm uh, that is maintaining a blood pressure above uh, 30. And I don't think that would surprise anybody. Uh, what surprised me a little is when you look at the more immature babies, almost regardless of the definition that was used, nearly all of them were receiving inotrope. Now, I appreciate the numbers are small, but of the 16 babies delivered at 23 to 24 weeks, 15 of them receive inotrope, uh, which is something that uh, I find uh, quite, quite a high number. In our own study, when we looked at randomizing babies to what we defined as the standard approach, which was the administration of volume and dopamine if your blood pressure was less than your gestational age, uh, 
And for this study, it was a time period of 15 minutes, continuous invasive uh, blood pressure compared to a, a, a purely observational approach. And those babies were in their seat of inotrope. And the reason I put this up here was to show that these babies had normal lactate values uh, and had low blood pressure values, means of 21 and, and 22. And it won't surprise you that uh, there was no difference in our primary outcome. The numbers enrolled overall was only 58. So really unable to, to state with any degree of, of uh, certainty that either approach was, uh, was better. Um, but what we did see was in the group who had an observational approach, so received placebo, two thirds of those went on to receive another agent. And of, of those babies, um, of the two thirds of babies, uh, the majority received an inotrope. Uh, overall, 50% of the babies randomized to um, an observational approach received an inotrope. So the corollary of that is 50% of babies randomized to an approach that uh, was observation only ended up receiving an inotrope, suggesting that perhaps this sort of approach to care, uh, uh, more individualized approach, if you will, uh, will reduce the percentage of babies in receipt of inotrope. And here we see the placebo arm. So these are babies who never received inotrope, and you see their blood pressure spontaneously increasing over that first two hour window. The group that received dopamine and responded had a pretty significant increase in, in uh, mean bl blood pressure. This is the differential between the gestational age and the actual blood pressure. So had a, a blood pressure increase of about seven millimeters of mercury or so at five mics per kilo of, uh, of uh, dopamine, uh, suggesting that potentially adverse impacts of, of uh, alterations in blood pressure over a relatively short time window. And the group that received no inotrope, so that group who received placebo and no second line intervention, those babies overall, the majority of them actually had a very good outcome, 14 out of the 15 babies. And I appreciate again, very small numbers, but, but I guess these are hypotheses generating 14 out of the 15 babies surviving without uh, brain injury. So the take home message from that particular study, perhaps in a well looking infant with low blood pressure, I think, it's okay to stop and think before you commence treatment. And for many of these babies, they have probably a transitional, sorry, a transient transitional low blood pressure, which potentially will uh, increase spontaneously over time. And I guess the problem for all of us is how do we better objectify these babies? And uh, so how do we go from just looking at this value to getting a better sense of the baby overall? And, and Satyan spoke about NIRS earlier, there are other assessment tools available at the bedside. Um, and again, uh, many are familiar with these. I'm not going to labor them, just perhaps to discuss one or two of them uh, in the next few minutes or so. ECHO, of course, um, uh, being, I guess, the predominant uh, objective source of information within the neonatal intensive care unit. And this is very nice paper from uh, Danny and Amish um, last year giving us some insight into the possible physiology of low blood pressure in the first uh, day of life amongst extremely preterm infants. And uh, in this case control study of 27 babies, what they found was that the patients who presented with uh, low blood pressure had a uh, proportion of them had uh, a large ductus, uh, over seven out of 10 uh, babies having a ductus greater than 1.5 millimeters with a mean ductal diameter difference of 1.6 to uh, one millimeter. They also had um, increased indices of left ventricular systolic function and lower estimates of left ventricular afterload. So suggesting that the PDA is a contributing factor, decreased uh, afterload is a factor and left ventricular function is not impaired in these uh, babies. Other readily available tools at the bedside, which we don't maybe look at a lot, but I think the pulsatility index is something that is of interest and something that uh, needs some further uh, evaluation. Uh, here is data from uh, Frank Van Bell's group. Uh, and here you see just over the first 24 hours, and for those of you who are familiar with, with the whole flow uh, data in, in this population of babies, here we see this uh, drop-off in pulsatility index uh, 
uh, regardless of gestational age, over that six to 24 hour window or six to 18 hour window, similar to the fall off we see in superior vena cava flow. And we looked at this a bit further. We looked at taking that signal and, and looking at it in a bit more detail, looking at various oscillations within the signal, slow and fast oscillations. And here we've, we dichotomized approximately 100 babies, uh, those who had a, a normal outcome and those who had a, an adverse outcome defined as the presence of an IVH or mortality. And those babies who had a normal outcome tended to have higher uh, mean trend PI values, so higher values overall, and actually had higher degrees of variability in their um, uh, D-trend value, um, suggesting that high values are uh, uh, with a good degree of variability are associated with good outcome. And this is data from a colleague, a friend in, in Dublin, looking at the utilization of non-invasive cardiac output monitoring as a potential tool to give us some insight into, into the underlying potential physiology. And here, small numbers of babies overall, those who had an adverse outcome, I think it was six in total compared to 20 something babies, those babies with an adverse outcome tended to have a lower flow initially, and then had this reperfusion type injury in, in around uh, 30 hours and onwards. Again, uh, important data, giving us some insight into the potential uh, etiology of IVH in low flow states. And this is data from our own unit looking at the utilization of an ICON monitor, slightly different uh, non-invasive cardiac output monitor. And again, you may appreciate just that reduction in, in flow over that initial 6 to 12, 20 to 18 hour window, if you will. And here we see babies who have a normal outcome tending to have slightly lower values compared to those of an adverse outcome. But when you look at the groups based on their gestational age, those extremely preterm babies tend to have higher values. And when we corrected for gestational age, we didn't see any difference between those who had a good and a normal outcome. This is data from Japan, who I guess have been um, uh, very engaged with ECHO over the last 10 to 15 years or so. And this is work looking at uh, an approach that was perfusion based. And in this case, it was the utilization of a uh, Doppler, uh, laser Doppler on the skin uh, compared to a blood pressure based approach. And in this trial of uh, almost 440 babies, the blood flow management protocol didn't significantly decrease the incidence of IVH. But I think, again, it highlighted some of the potential adjunctive therapies that we have available to us to better objectify these babies rather than jump in based on blood pressure values alone. And Satyan has spoken about cerebral nerves. And just to give you some insight into this from our own um, data from the, the HIP trial, looking at babies who had uh, hypotension and those who were normal tensive. And in the babies who had hypotension, obviously they have lower blood pressure values over the first uh, three days of life. Interestingly, their RSO2 values, their absolute RSO2 values were no different uh, between day one, two, and three. But what we did find was when you looked at the cerebral sat less than 63%, uh, a marker of cerebral hypoxia, those babies were hypotensive, tended to have a greater proportion of their time spent in that range. And when you looked at a, a measure of cerebral autoregulation transfer function gain measures, the higher the gain value, the, the more impaired the autoregulatory phenomena. And here you see across day one, two, and three, the gain function value higher in those babies who are hypotensive, suggesting that they may have uh, impaired autoregulation. And this was the, the uh, pre and post implementation of dopamine uh, compared to placebo. And you won't be surprised to see that there was uh, an increase in blood pressure values following initiation of uh, inotrope, but ultimately very little difference in the percentage of time the RSO2 value was less than 63% between the groups overall. We also looked at EEG in this, and, and uh, I don't have time to get into this in a lot of detail, but other than to say those babies who are hypotensive compared to those babies who are normal tensive tended to have what looked like an EEG that was slightly more immature, despite the fact that they were matched for gestational age. So the median or EEG or range EEG was lower in the group who were hypotensive and a number of other markers, uh, the IBI length uh, were, were lower, suggestive of a lower gestational age, if you will. And this is work from Michael Weindling's group from an, a number of years ago, 
looking at uh, the RP of the delta band as a measure of EEG activity and looking at mean blood pressure values over the first day of life. And here you see a uh, what appears to be an autoregulatory uh, curve, if you will. And I guess that takes me to the, the final point. I guess it would be lovely to be able to stand at the bedside and be able to determine in this individual baby, well, do I need to, to get worried? Do I need to do something? Do I need to start an agent? How is this baby behaving from an autoregulatory capacity? Are we there yet? No, but I think we're starting to, to work our way towards this. And this is just some work that we've done in the past, looking at transfer function gain. I alluded to it there previously. And some other work from around the world. This is work from um, Elizabeth Kwai in, in um, uh, Groningen, looking at almost like a traffic light, uh, red, green, and yellow uh, measure of autoregulatory capacity in real time, looking at, at um, uh, blood pressure, uh, RSO2 values, SO, SpO2 values, and giving you a readout continuously. And again, similar work from Gunnar Nalor's group in um, Belgium, uh, looking at um, the potential for bedside autoregulatory real-time measures to guide therapy. And this was just data from our own study looking at, at the relationship between transfer gain and uh, mean arterial blood pressure. And here, just to direct you towards we, we talk about hypotension a lot, but I think we should worry a little bit about hypertension as well and the potential impact of hypertension and the relationship with decreased, uh, sorry, with uh, IVH, um, our, our mortality uh, within the first day of life. So to conclude, I mean, what is insanity? I think it's what we're continuing to do in the management of blood pressure, the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And I think we do need a paradigm shift in our management approach. Undoubtedly, low blood pressure is associated with impaired autoregulation, low blood flow, decreased oxygenation, decreased EEG activity, potentially brain injury, mortality, but it's only one marker. It really is only one marker of circulatory well-being. And my, you know, my contention should, our, uh, contention should be rarely intervene based on single low values. Treatment itself brings its own potential adverse effects. And you know, when you're dealing with complex problems, which this is, there are no simple solutions to these complex problems. And we really need to strive uh, to better understand the physiology that's occurring in these babies, and hence the importance of all these adjunct uh, monitoring tools available to us in the neonatal intensive care unit. And I'll leave you with that. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, just as a reminder to those, uh, go ahead and keep putting your uh, questions in the question and answer, and we'll get to those at the end of our talks. Um, so next up, um, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Patrick McNamara. He is division director uh, at the University of Iowa, and he is going to be enlightening us on PDA physiology in 2022. Thanks, Amy. I didn't realize I was next. I thought it was somebody else. <laughs> good job I was in the room. That's good. I was going to be like, oh, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Let me just share my slides. Okay. So uh, see the slides okay? Yes, they look yes. great. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So uh, thanks to you and uh, Phil's introduction. Great, great lineup this afternoon. Pleasure, privilege to be involved. Um, I get to talk about kind of the probably the most, well, maybe not the most controversial topic after listening to Jean, uh, but certainly one of the most controversial topics in neonatology, which is the approach to, to PDA care. Uh, like hypotension, it's incredibly disappointing that we are now a specialty that has invested close to 70 years in this top this domain, yet we do not seem to appreciate a solution. 1956 was the first report by Mostyn Powell that in kind of 34 to 36 week infants, a subpopulation developed a progressive respiratory illness. That was associated with a large shunt that when you fix the shunt, the babies got better. And there's certainly, again, you've heard the word association and similar to hypotension, there's a lot of association of PDA with bad things. 
uh, this is some work from Stephen Polder in the late 1970s showing that infants who had an open duct when they developed neck were more likely to die than those in whom the ductus was closed. Yet we're in an era in which there's been a fairly significant secular trend away from pediatric therapy as evidenced by data on the right from the Canadian neonatal network. If you look at the neonatal research network and several other networks in the world, you see a very, very similar trend. And uh, this has caused a lot of confusion and actually has cultivated, I would say in many opinions, fairly strong evangelical opinions and polarized thinking. You know, with strong proponents of you should still treat every PDA and other proponents of you should never, not just treat the PDA, but don't even bother doing a scan because it's a waste of time. So before moving forward, we first need to reconcile the literature. And I think it's really, really important to, to reflect on what we know. So the best natural history study is the Semberova study conducted by Jan Milton's group from Dublin, which shows very clearly that in many babies, particularly older and more mature babies, the probability of spontaneous closure is higher. However, if one looks at the sub 26 week population, the median closure time was 72 days. And if we think of an average of, kind of uh, this duration of time, is this an acceptable risk? Secondly, many, many babies who died in the first postnatal week uh, were excluded, which you know, gets to the probability what percentage of those infants in that first postnatal week actually had an open duct. And certainly looking at the literature in what's published and certainly look at our own experience, the vast majority of the babies who do die in the first week do have an open duct. And then finally, how does spontaneous closure occur? And this is a, an area of a lot of uncertainty. We assume it's a process of natural PDA remodeling. However, the alternative explanation may be in the face of progressive endothelial and pulmonary vascular remodeling, there may be a diminution in the transductal pressure gradient leading to decreased flow and perhaps closure, but at the expense of pulmonary vascular disease. The second, and again, we must look at the literature and the literature shows very clearly that based on randomized trial evidence, treatment, decreases patency based on those infants who receive therapy without improving outcomes. So how do we reflect on this? And I think it's really important to go back to the words of Dave Sackett, which is that evidence-based medicine is a conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of evidence for the individual patients. And you heard both Jean and Satyan say very clearly that we must individualize and actually not practice in a very broad, and non-physiologic manner. So in thinking about the data then and thinking about the studies, we need to ask, are the babies in the trials those that we actually are interested in? Second, is the mechanism of disease and its relationship to morbidity well understood? Do the treatments make sense? And I think most importantly, is treatment efficacious? If we review the data to date, up to 40% of the clinical trials did not include echo. And more concerningly, almost every one of these trials have excluded PDA-dependent circulations. And I include this as not just congenital heart disease, but severe heart dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension. In addition, the vast majority of trials have randomized babies based on a single point estimate of PDA diameter. And if you look at the reliability data of most of the measurements that we use, um, in centers that provide a hemodynamic service, you can see that diameter, in addition to LAO ratio, have the least reliability. In addition to this, work from Fernando Martins looking at the relationship of diameter, indexed or not, to other physiologic measures of shunt volume, you can see that the R squared values are low, which is not surprising given the fact that there are many, many determinants of flow according to Poisset's law that we talked about earlier this week. In addition, the ductus is not a geometric structure that is easily distinguishable between patients. It comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, as you can see from these four images here. And why that's important is we make the assumption echocardiographically 
that the ductus is circular in cross-section. This may not be the case, particularly in medically treated patients where you may get partial narrowing uh, at different parts of the ductus, such that you may over or underestimate just based on diameter alone. This was further emphasized by a study we conducted here recently in which uh, we looked at babies in the cath lab and we looked at the relationship between diameter measured in the cath lab by echo, uh, both at the aortic and pulmonary end and its length, and compare this to the actual values that were obtained during angiography. And what you can actually see is that there may be a bias of up to 0.4 millimeters at the pulmonary end and 1.7 millimeters at the aortic end. And that becomes really, really important when you enter into a randomized trial. We may be randomizing babies with a 1.8 millimeter ductus that may actually not be very big. And we may be missing babies just on a single point estimate. Do the trials include a control group? The answer is no. Pretty much universally, we have um, randomized babies to treatment versus treatment at some other time. And in the PDA tolerate trial, um, up to 63% of patients in the control group receive therapy. The other important consideration is that when we randomize babies, we assume that there will be ductal patency for a sufficient duration of time in the control group. PDA tolerate told us that the rate of spontaneous closure may be as high as 80% in some centers and as low as 20%, suggesting that there may be intrinsic variability in duration of shunt in the patients in the trial. And you heard Gene talk about that with respect to hypertension. In addition, you know, are the data contemporary? And for the most part, the answer is no. We really don't have any randomized trial evidence in 22 and 23 weekers. We don't have trial evidence uh, kind of, you know, from many areas in which we did not have nitric oxide, different ways to ventilate patients and so forward. So the concept that perhaps we need to consider trial expiry is something that really, I think, is important for us to think about. Two final considerations. One, equipoise is a major issue for clinicians. In PDA tolerate, 40% of eligible patients were not randomized based on clinician preference. And these babies who were younger, smaller, and sicker were more likely to receive therapy, but therapy in the first five days. And interestingly, their outcomes in terms of death or BPD were superior to any of the babies who were randomized, which I think is really, really important. You know, we make that assumption that that baby that we take care of today who is sick, that has a PDA, is a baby in a trial. That may not always be the case. The other important consideration, and I think this is something that we really pay, need to pay attention to, is that we assume that the lack of efficacy of medical therapy means that the problem, PDA, is not a problem. Some early preliminary evidence of the importance of this comes from this post hoc analysis of uh, the study conducted by a thief in Dublin, which, as you can see here, you know, raises the importance that intervention success is something we may need to think about. Those babies in whom the PDA was closed by day seven had the best outcomes compared to the intervention failure group or the placebo group. I would say probably the best evidence we have in the year 2022 that perhaps that there are still some babies that need treatment comes from those centers who have kind of uh, evolved to non-intervention. And I think it's important to, to recognize that it's not always absolute non-intervention, but in those places, and this is just the, the Montreal data, in the subpopulation of babies under 26 weeks, a composite outcome of death or BPD increased by 31%. And this has been seen kind of in other centers uh, in the United States and beyond. So you've already heard Jean just present Albert Einstein. Well, here he's back again. I think this is really, really important. You know, defining the problem and defining what we're interested in is something that we have failed to do. You know, and as Albert said, if I was given one hour to save the world, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem. We really have spent the 59 minutes randomizing babies while actually deciding who were the patients that we're most interested in. So if you are to design the ideal trial, I think one needs to recognize that there are PDA attributed morbidities such as IVH, hypotension, pulmonary hemorrhage that are early in the first seven days, and those that are late like neck or BPD. And the ideal trial would be a comparison of an early intervention 
in a high risk population with a very low risk of spontaneous closure. This is the only way we'll be able to solve this problem. And perhaps Pivotal may help us. So how do we do better? Well, we need to think of the physiology and the recognition that shunt is determined by pressure difference, uh, by length of vessel, by diameter vessel and so forth. But with respect to what we're interested in, magnitude and duration of the shunt are probably more important than just the mere evidence that the shunt is, is, is present. And when one thinks about the physiology of a large left to right shunt, you're not just exposing the pulmonary vascular bed to too much blood and shear stress, you're also exposing it to a much higher PO2 as you recirculate hyperoxygenated blood. And certainly you've heard from Satyan the dangers of that. So this may create the biological milieu in some patients when you put this together with ventilator lung damage and so forth, that we may have a higher than normal risk of pulmonary arterial hypertension in those babies with the worst shunts. The problem is that early clinical signs are imprecise. And if you look at those babies that present with the features of pulmonary overcirculation and systemic hyperperfusion, the clinical signs include worsening ventilation and a drop in the postductal blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic. And remembering that most of these babies, it's a UAC blood pressure that we're measuring. Mere hypotension may be the only clinical sign of PDA. What evidence do we have of concern to the immature lung? We've got both animal evidence from the baboon showing that persistent of high volume shunt with QPQS as opposed to resolution of shunt was associated with abnormal compliance and increased risk of impaired alveologenesis at 36 weeks. This is some work from Danny Weiss in Toronto showing compared to the medically treated population, the surgical population represent the group with the most prolonged and most severe shunts. And as you can see, their respiratory requirements are much higher and that occurs quite early in the first few days. Some other evidence for the importance of persistent of shunt comes from, this is again, post hoc analysis of PDA tolerate. Babies who have prolonged ventilation and prolonged exposure to large shunts are more likely to have, as you see in the black box, the more severe forms of grade two, three PPD. We've known for a long time that, you know, even in PDA, that there's an association with pulmonary hypertension. And we're now starting to see from our cath lab data, this is some work from um, Sham in Memphis, that infants with the most prolonged exposure more than eight weeks had higher pulmonary vascular resistance. This is not the only evidence. Some recent work published uh, from uh, a group in Taiwan showed that in comparing those infants with severe BPD-associated pulmonary hypertension, duration of shunt more than 28 days was independently a strong predictor of the likelihood of pulmonary hypertension. And certainly there is emerging evidence from other centers that this may indeed be the case. So how did we reconcile this in Iowa? And when I got here in 2018, you know, to this incredible center that is built on you know, the importance of physiology with respect to the lung, nutrition, and so forth, we have a very, very high survival rate, particularly at 22 and 23 weeks. And our outcomes are good, but there were still, as you can see here, 20% risk of severe IVH, 6 to 7% risk of neck, and a very high rate of PDA ligation. You've heard Gene talk about hypotension. I just want to point out a fact here. This is a paper recently published uh, from the pediatrics group. Dopamine is the most fourth most common drug given to 22 and 23 week infants in the first seven postnatal days, even more common than caffeine suggesting that there's a lot of treatment for hypotension. We know from uh, Anna Selmer's study that um, the presence of a large PD on day three is associated at least with death, severe IVH, and neck. We know from the population-based study conducted um, by Afif when he was in Canada and then in Ireland, that Infants with large PDAs that remain persistent for the first seven days may as early as day two have high flow in the pulmonary veins, higher left ventricular output, and compromised flow to end organs, suggesting that at least physiologically, the ductus may be a player in the first week. And the concept that these babies already have or have pulmonary hypertension for seven days really is not true. 
Getting back to the hypotension, some interesting work from, uh, from Melissa Leibovitz and Ron Kleiman, what happens when you stop prophylactic in the medicine? And what you can see here, the rate of refractory hypotension increased significantly uh, in the conservative epoch. And when they looked at what was associated with this vasopressor dependent hypotension, the presence of a moderate to large PDA was seen with a high percentage in these babies. The importance of early intervention was really first tested in a randomized controlled trial by Martin Klocka. Unfortunately, it's a small study because they ran out of endomethacin, so it was underpowered for the primary outcome. But despite this, babies who received early therapy based on just, and this is just based on a single diameter threshold, did have a lower rate of pulmonary hemorrhage and need for late treatment. But what intrigued us was this low rate of IVH. So there's something about endomethacin and the etiology of IVH that may be important. And you've heard others speak about this during this week. So if one thinks about what we know, we know that infants that have a very low cardiac output state in the first six hours are more likely to develop left ventricular hemorrhage, or sorry, to IVH. And if you are an infant who has had low flow, in whom the ductus is closed or is, is, remains open, as PVR falls, there's going to be an augmentation in the left to right shunt, which theoretically is going to drive an increase in left heart preload and an increase in cardiac output. So again, this is all theoretical. The brain may go from a low flow to a high flow state. And there certainly is some evidence from Shahab Nouri and others of the importance of maintaining a stable cardiac output as a means to prevent IVH. So is this an ischemia reperfusion event? There are some data, this is a FIFS work that a PDA score may predict outcomes such as death or BPD. So putting this together, and I'm not going to go into much details about the overall screening approach, but one of the major determinants of why we screened early was to identify shunts that were progressive and provide a targeted approach to therapy. This was very much built on the concept of a multi-parametric assessment and the fact that it's just not that easy to rely on any one marker to say that the shunt is significant and in combination, perhaps a series of markers may help us identify the populations of interest. But when we actually looked at the results of, you know, all the screening echoes on these babies, and there now is data on uh, more than 200 babies, 25% met the criterion of hemodynamically significant PDA. But there was, you know, 70% of babies that either had heart dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension, which would be a relative contraindication to closing the duct. And certainly if you give prophylactic in the medicine, you may expose these babies to an intervention that may not be helpful. This is how we approach the PDA in Iowa. And based on a comprehensive score, if these infants meets the criterion with a score of more than six, we would provide acetaminophen for three days. If the shunt remains significant but improving, we will continue to seven days. If after seven days they still have a shunt, we will provide in the medicine. If one course does absolutely nothing, we may proceed then to device closure. If there's some benefit, we may proceed to a second course. Why do we choose acetaminophen or Tylenol? Well, there are many, many babies that receive uh, postnatal uh, transitional hydrocortisone and because of the concern about intestinal perforation, we decided to use acetaminophen. We actually don't know how acetaminophen really closes the PDA because certainly the in vitro studies that we did with Jeff Reese suggest that it's not a direct ductal vasoconstrictor. And certainly when you look at the amount of muscle uh, in the ductus at 22 and 23 weeks, there's very little. The alternative explanation is through its effect on pulmonary vascular resistance. And by preventing the drop in PVR in the appropriate babies, by decreasing transductal flow, do we actually allow normal mechanisms of PDA closure? In addition to the use of acetaminophen, we pay attention to Poisset's law, as you've learned earlier this week. As I mentioned before, you know, we don't have a lot of evidence for these physiologic maneuvers. It's very much translated evidence from our single ventricle physiology patients, but theoretically, avoiding hypocapnia avoiding anemia are probably good things because those are things that will promote increasing flow. Uh, 
optimizing lung recruitment, and certainly we avoid fluid restriction or the use of fruzamide earlier. And the reason for avoiding fluid restriction really comes from this randomized controlled trial from De Boost in Holland, in which those infants who were restricted, their PDAs really didn't change much in terms of size, but they did have a reduction in blood supply to the brain. So what have we learned? And Reagan presented the overall EPOC study. And one of the questions asked by many people, well, what about PDA? So we've just completed uh, this post hoc analysis in which we compared infants in the prior epoch where treatment was only provided after day seven, which really reflects the standard in most centers in the United States, and compared those babies to uh, patients in the modern epoch who had the approach I've just described. Interestingly, um, the rate of 22 and 23 weeks increased from 23% in the prior epoch to 46% in the new epoch, knowing that these are all infants under 27 weeks gestation. There were favorable things in the modern epoch, more delayed cork clamping, a higher rate of magnesium sulfate, but there were harmful things, more breach presentation, higher rate of antenatal uh, non-steroidals, threefold increase in maternal obesity, um, and an increase in maternal SSRIs. When we looked at the data, um, the primary outcome was the composite of death or severe BPD, which, as you can see, was reduced significantly. But in addition to this, there were other favorable things. Our rate of PDA closure was halved. The rate of significant IVH was reduced. The rate of neck was reduced. And most interestingly, going back to what Jean just presented, the rate of vasopressor use in the first week was reduced from 25% to 8%. This is the results of the logistic regression analysis, which basically shows, and again, focused on the most important part, the presence of early screening was associated with a 4.6 odds increase in a reduction in the survival severe of BPD, um, independent of the other factors. So to wrap up, EDA is associated with Major neonatal morbidity, but an imprecise and indiscriminatory approach is probably not beneficial. There are some preliminary evidence relevant to the Iowa cohort that this may optimize outcomes, but this certainly needs to be confirmed in a much larger study as to what that study should be, perhaps a cluster randomized controlled trial. But certainly to move forward in the field, we've got to select our patients correctly, selecting those babies with the worst shunts that are not likely to close spontaneously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, for that wonderful talk. Um, next up, we have Dr. Amish Jain, who's a staff neonatologist and director of the Targeted Neonatal ECHO program um, at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Um, and he is going to be uh, talking about chronic pulmonary hypertension. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, it's a bit scary following all these high-end talks by these people. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to do justice to a topic, but it is a completely different topic than all the other topics we've talked about. So hopefully that will save me. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is chronic pulmonary hypertension in uh, BPD um, in, in kingdom infants. <clears throat> a, a quick disclosure. Um, I do actually have a investigator initiated research drawn from Malincourt Pharmaceuticals for creating a uh, data registry for preterm infants receiving INO in Canadian and ICUs. It's got nothing to do with chronic pulmonary hypertension, but some of these patients may be. Um, it's needless to say that there will be some mention of off-level use of pulmonary vasodilator therapies, even though I'm not directly recommending anything. So uh, let me start with a particular case, and this is a real life case, which sort of got us, uh, me and Patrick, uh, sort of started discussing this long, many, many years ago, but it's a classical case, which I'm sure all of you can can, uh, can um, um, relate to, um, you know, a, a typical preterm infants who initially received uh, RDS, mechanical ventilation, a degree of lung inflammation, uh, but finally got extubated using DART protocols, and then was appeared to be doing quite well um, or reasonably well on non-invasive respiratory support, who out of the blue starts getting worse in respiratory symptoms um, around 30, 32 weeks, uh, the correct gestational age. Um, or, or a bit late. Um, and because of those symptoms, get septic workup, 
um, um, I mean, this kid, particular kid, got uh, reintubated or got went into an uh, or uh, escalated in respiratory support, and there was no real etiology known. Now, this is the kid that we scanned, um, and to be honest, we scanned this kid because this was many years ago, and we were not really screening for pulmonary hypertension at that time. Um, we scanned this kid primarily for looking at potential PDA. That's what the request was for, because the etiology was not known. And what we saw here, you can see. At the bottom is the left ventricle here and top is the right ventricle. At that age, which is about six to eight weeks of age, the right ventricle really should be quite small and nice crescent around the left and the, the septum should be quite round throughout. And what we are seeing here is a completely flat septum um, between the right and left ventricle and the right ventricle is quite dilated. Um, so this is, this is a very, uh, and ever since then, as we scan more and more of these kids, we start observing a, a, a lot more. Um, of this phenotype. And since then, it actually has, uh, uh, you know, there have been many, many publications um, that have been, uh, that have sort of highlighted this particular disease in premature infants with lung disease. Um, another inter observation that we had, and this is again around the same time, that there are these, some of these kids with lung disease um, develop this excessive weight gain uh, much later. Um, and this particular case was around 40 weeks, but some of them will be about 36, 37 weeks when they start getting too much weight gain. And to be honest, this, this particular case was missed for quite a few weeks. Um, and pe people, um, to, and, and to the point that actually people actually were pleased by the weight gain initially, it's only when it went uh, much higher and baby became really uh, adamant is that the, the, the penny dropped. Um, and this was a baby with severe chronic pulmonary hypertension who actually remained on respiratory support um, and uh, we were consulted in somewhere around 45 or 46 weeks when we diagnosed the, the, the patient. And this was all before we actually had our, our, our screening program in place. But this is something which we, which we do see. Um, and now in our unit, because of this, um, uh, our dietitians have been sort of sensitized to the particular problem. And we typically tend to pick, up, then pick them up much earlier around this age when we start the first time seeing excessive weight gain for no, uh, no real explanation. So what is the evidence about chronic pulmonary hypertension we have? Um, now we've known from uh, basic science studies uh, and, and, and from uh, BPD literature for quite some time that BPD is associated with the uh, pulmonary vascular remodeling um, and, and uh, uh, a, a distal muscularization of pulmonary blood vessels. But really it was this particular paper which brought that into, into clinicians' at, uh, attention. And this was a paper by Kimani et al, where they, um, they, run, they had a, a pulmonary hypertension referral clinic and they've presented their experience of patients, of ex-premature patients with BPD who were diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension post-discharge. And what they found was that the patients who had severe pulmonary arterial hypertension at discharge, and you can see here, these are, these are months after diagnosis of PAH, um, these patients had a, a very high mortality rate, almost about a severe ones was about almost 80% by the first year of life, by the first year after, after diagnosis. And, and what this paper suggested was that this disease is quite severe and sick if it is not diagnosed early on. And obviously there was a, um, this was a referral cohort. So there's obviously a patient selection bias, but within those patients who were referred to them for pulmonary hypertension, the severity of pulmonary hypertension uh, had a very, very high mortality. Now, after this particular study, there have been a number of uh, epidemiological investigations published, which uh, confirmed the incidence um, of this particular uh, disease using different uh, uh, methods, obviously. Um, uh, and, and three of them have been prospective uh, cohort studies and a bunch of retrospective studies. But all in all, what they have consistently demonstrated is that there is a, uh, the overall incidence of chronic pulmonary hypertension almost universally diagnosed on echocardiography in patients uh, in, in ELBW infant, for example, is about 25 to 30%. Um, and the relationship is uh, is, is uh, intricately linked to the severity of lung disease. And you can see the, this paper from Korea where the mild BPD uh, cases um, uh, actually had no, uh, no, uh, no patient with the pH, while the moderate one has about 10% and the severe BPD ones have almost 55 to 60% incidence. Um, more recently, uh, one of our, uh, uh, my, my colleagues here in sick kids, Dr. Bonnie Jasani, actually conducted a a, a uh, updated uh, systematic review meta-analysis and basically shows the same thing um, where you can see that the incidence of chronic pulmonary hypertension sort of um, uh, parallels with the severity of chronic lung disease and patients with no BPD maybe uh, have an average of 3% incidence and same about mild seems to be same as no BPD cases while moderate he found about 15% and severe um, the range was 60% to almost to, to, uh, to about 16, 17% but average uh, 
put them together came out to be about 40 percent um now similarly uh, almost consistent finding across studies is that the patients with bpd and ph have higher inpatient mortality our mortality in the first year of life compared to bpd without the diagnosis of ph and again this was also confirmed by this uh, this this uh, updated meta analysis that the uh, that the ph in the context of bpd increases the risk of mortality um, the other um, outcomes that is now very well known that are worse in these patients you know, are, are mostly respiratory morbidities um, such as longer need for oxygen therapy longer need for ventilation and much longer stay in hospital um, uh, there are a couple of uh, quite weak paper that I'm not going to go into detail of. They have demonstrated that there may also be a uh, increased risk, uh, increased risk of neurodevelopmental impairments in BPD patient with pH uh, at 1824 months compared to BPD patient without pH. But those two studies are quite quite weak, and so that that's still not yet completely uh, well defined. That the what is the association with long term neurodevelopmental outcomes? And nevertheless. The mortality and the respiratory morbidity is pretty much uh, well, well, well established, and they're not even up for debate anymore. Um, so, what happens in this patient? This is a very interesting paper that came from uh, from uh, uh, Berger Group, where we basically um, they followed a cohort of patients post discharge, post their diagnosis of, of pH, um, and and was able to tell us what exactly transpires beyond thirty six weeks of life. On the left side, you can see here. Their criteria for diagnosing uh, pH is pretty standard. This is what we all end up using clinically and majority of research studies because we don't really have anything better than this. Um, in the presence of a supracardiac shunt um, uh, and, or, or cardiac shunt, uh, it has to be a bidirectional right to left flow across the PDA or, or PFO. And to be honest, that is quite uncommon in this patient population. There are a few patients we get diagnosed by using this criteria, but majority of patients don't have a PDA by the time we are diagnosing their, their pH. Um, so the mostly criteria they used was that the right ventricle systolic pressure using tricuspid regurgitation to be more than 40, or which is the most commonly utilized criteria, is that the, uh, the ratio of the RVSP to systolic blood pressure of more than 0.5. That basically indicates, um, ends up being a systolic septal flattening. And that really is the by far the most commonest criteria used because all the other parameters are often absent um, at, at the age that we are dealing with these kids. So the one thing they did was they actually um, confirmed the same finding as Kimani et al. had about uh, 15 years ago, um, that the patient's mortality risk is dependent upon the severity of their pulmonary hypertension. Now, this, this, uh, unlike that paper where the diagnosis was made, made post-discharge, these babies were actually diagnosed at 36 weeks post menstrual age, and they can, you can see their, uh, uh, this is the, the time after that, uh, the, in months after that. And the patient who had suprasystemic pulmonary hypertension at diagnosis um, had a very high mortality. Uh, the patient with subsystemic uh, or systemic, which basically means not suprasystemic, I guess, um, also had a reasonable mortality, but were, but survived more commonly than the suprasystemic ones. So again, mortality is linked with, with the severity of pH. But this probably is one of the most interesting uh, contributions of this particular paper uh, to our understanding, um, is that the patient who survived, the pH resolves over the first um, you know, over the first uh, 36 months um, after diagnosis. So that would be around 30, 30, uh, about two, two and a half years of life. Um, and you can see the majority of death occurs in the first six months of diagnosis. And after that, pH kept resolving. So that sort of puts an, another complexity uh, in, in um, another layer of complexity in what we do with these patients, because we know the natural history, if the patient survives into, and, and we are able to keep them asymptomatic, pH will resolve. And this resolution is with lung growth, with the uh, development of more blood vessels. And this is very unlike the, uh, the, the primary uh, pulmonary hypertension or the pulmonary hypertension that is diagnosed in, uh, in, in much older children, um, and particularly in adults, because that pH is the life-limiting uh, disorder which doesn't go away on its own. So it's much easier to select patients for treatment there um, versus in our population where we, we, uh, we know we want to avoid over-treatment and only pick up those patients who are suffering from it um, or, or those who are at risk of mortality, and that the, how do we do that is as we heard in in the in the talk with the uh, with and all the other uh, speakers. It really has to be individualized and carefully thought about because not everybody with pH is gonna is gonna be at risk of dying, and we don't want to over treat our patients. At least, till better evidence emerge. Uh, what about the timing of uh, pH diagnosis? So this was a this is till date uh, the largest cohort prospective cohort study conducted in this patient population by. 
by Morani, and you can see there is about uh, 277 patients. They scan them in the first seven days, um, and then at 36 weeks, and try to diagnose early pH and late pH, and understand the relationship between the two. Um, the definition of pH was basically same as uh, more or less the same as I previously described. And what you can see here that the incidence of early pH was quite a lot. There was a lot of babies. 115 out of 277 patients had early pH, but the incidence of late pH was not uh, not the same. And the early pH um, uh, only became late pH or remained late pH in about 20% of cases, while 80% did not uh, uh, continue to have pH at 36 weeks. On the other hand, the patient who did not have early pH, 10% of them still developed late pH and the rest did not. Um, again, the early pH was a predictor of late pH, but the sensitivity and specificity was quite low for it to be a, a treatment threshold. Um, again, suggesting that we still looking for a, a way of diagnosing early and using the same criteria at seven days as 36 weeks will not pick majority of, uh, uh, will not pick uh, um, uh, a whole lot of, peer of, of late pH kids. Um, so what do we know? That uh, pH can occur uh, early or late. Um, and as I said, pH, we, uh, as I said, this, our understanding so far is using the same definition of pH at varying gestational ages, independent of, independent of postnatal age which probably is not uh, necessarily an accurate thing to do, uh, but that's all we have so far. Um, early pH may become late pH, and or, 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 or absence of early pH may become late pH, and this is a big, big cro uh, crossover. Um, we know that the late pH is directly related to the severity of BPD, and we know from an outcome perspective that in hospital uh, or, or post-discharge mortality, uh, respiratory morbidity um, is definitely increased in patients who have BPD and late pH. Adverse neurodevelopmental outcome is, is still up, up, uh, up for debate, uh, but they most likely will have increased, uh, uh, increased uh, neuro neurosensory impairment um, uh, if you believe the pilot data published till date. Um, early pH itself is a predictor of late pH, and early pH is also a predictor of severity of BPD eventually. So uh, if you have a patient who've been diagnosed with pH at seven or 14 days of life, those, those patients are more likely to develop BPD. This is what the data shows us. Another risk factor that we know are gestational age, weight, SGA status, lung disease, uh, pulmonary hypoplasia at, uh, and or oligohydramnios at birth, or essentially uh, how much respiratory, uh, how much respiratory um, symptoms the patient had in the first week or two weeks of life. It's not surprising, which basically the same risk factor as the risk factors for, uh, for, 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 uh, for severe BPD itself. Now, that's all we know from an evidence perspective. We actually have almost no uh, evidence for management. What do we do with this? So our management is largely de uh, dependent upon um, expert guidelines published till date or our understanding of physiology or, or individualized care and, and, and then and trying to understand which patients can benefit from, from a more proactive management. So before I present the, the expert guidelines, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, physiology and primarily applied physiology because that's what I typically um, engage in my act, uh, activities I engage in clinically is, is, is uh, uh, applied physiology in these particular patients and we'll share some of the insights we have gained. First of all, uh, we have to understand what predisposes preterm infancy pulmonary hypertension. Um, and, and this is a figure from a review article from, uh, uh, from Satyan, um, which actually is quite nicely depicts that the pulmonary vascular resistance um, is higher uh, in utero and in fetuses uh, between 20 weeks and 30 weeks, and it gradually comes down. And this is the patient population that we typically look after who are the highest risk of BPD and, and, and the chronic pulmonary hypertension. So these patients, when they're born, the PVR is high, and it's supposed to fall down as it would have fallen down in utero. But if they had developed inflammation or they develop um, you know, uh, alveolar arrest or, or uh, lung development doesn't progress the same way, um, it's not entirely surprising that they, then the PVR drop down was supposed to happen doesn't take place. And the high PVR state continues for a longer period of time. So, so they, they do actually have a much smaller pulmonary uh, vascular bed and hence high PVR at rest, and which is who they are. Um, and on top of that, any, any, any lung disease can, can, uh, make a, can, can make the PVR stay high more easily. Um, another important concept to understand is the concept of pulmonary uh, uh, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So what this figure nicely shows is that if you have an alveoli which is not well aerated because there is suppose there's a mucus plug uh, at the, the terminal bronchiole what our body is designed to have is the arterioles around uh, which is supplying or other capillaries around that alveoli will vasoconstrict and that is done to, to actually maintain VQ mismatch so that the blood going in this 
hypoventilated alveola is not wasted. Um, this is a body's adaptive mechanism to maintain, hyper, uh, maintain their oxygenation extraction despite having a degree of um, hypoxemia. But if you have enough number of uh, uh, alveoli in the lung, which are a uh, collapse or atelectritic, you're going to have a net uh, uh, increase in, in, in pulmonary vascular resistance. Now, if you, that takes place, a more sustained increase in pulmonary vascular resistance because of uh, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction or recurrent episodes of that can promote inflammation and proliferation of the of the uh, of the smooth muscle cells in the in those arterioles, um, and the total time we spend in the in the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction has a direct relationship with the remodeling and and hence uh, uh, development of pulmonary hypertension in this patient population. So this is the, the reason this is important is that a lot of times when you uh, maybe in your center at least in our center when we consult our cardiology or respiratory colleagues, um, the first line, the first line um, uh, suggestion from them, and you will see that mentioned in a majority of guidelines, is to optimize respiratory support. And what they really are trying to say is this, to avoid uh, atelectasis. Um, and if you can avoid that early on and, and identify these patients, maybe you can limit the degree of uh, inflammation or, 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 or uh, and degree of remodeling this patient will have. So, what are the overall factors at play in chronic pulmonary hypertension? And I put these up together. Um, I'm not going to go into all the, the details of each and one of them, but this is more of a theoretical exercise. Um, the one in blue are probably uh, are, are not amenable to uh, to any uh, any management. For example, gestational age, SGA, pulmonary hypoplasia, or pre-birth vascular remodeling that you might have. So you can't do anything about that. But the, the one that I've highlighted in orange, we as clinicians uh, could, uh, modulate that by the way we manage these patients after birth in the first many weeks of life before they develop chronic pulmonary hypertension. So the severity of BPD can be can be altered by better uh, uh, better ventilation techniques um, by avoiding oxidative hypoxia and hyperoxic stress. Pneumonias or ventilation associated pneumonias, high pulmonary blood flow states like a large VST, ASTs or PDAs will contribute to chronic pulmonary hypertension. Presence of pulmonary edema from other factors or from chronic pulmonary hypertension itself, which we just go, we, we, we'll sort of discuss a little bit, HPV duration and so on and so forth. So just the, just the awareness of the factors that contribute to the chronic pulmonary hypertension state may allow us from a quality improvement perspective, um, some, uh, some uh, to, uh, to implement strategies which may be able to uh, minimize the number of patients who develop this secondary complication of DPD. Um, Another really important thing, and, and Satyan has already gone into real detail of this particular aspect, but just this re-emphasizes that when we're talking about chronic pulmonary hypertension, we're talking about mean pulmonary arterial pressure being high. That doesn't tell us from where it's coming from. And it is particularly important, even more so, I would argue, than PPHN patients than in this patient population, where uh, in chronic pulmonary hypertension, uh, because uh, they can have a they can have disorders like an ASD, PFO, and we see that quite a bit when we are scanning these patients, that they're, they do have pulmonary hypertension, but it is volume driven or driven by a chronic PDA presence because they have very high cardiac output, which is giving them the high pulmonary pressure. Those patients are not for pulmonary vasodilator therapy, for example, because you're going to make it worse. Um, even though the pulmonary arterial pressure that we are measuring on echo might be exactly the same. And the majority of patients are, are, are because of PVR, and that's what we are trying to identify. And then there is this uh, um, entity, particularly pulmonary vein stenosis, as, as uh, Satyan mentioned. Um, and, 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 and recent data suggests there is maybe there's a possibility of left ventricular uh, subclinical diastolic dysfunction, which we don't really recognize um, in these patient population with hypertension particularly, which may be contributing um, by, by increased uh, uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, um, which may then uh, uh, sort of contribute to mean pulmonary arterial pressure being high. Um, I would say that when you diagnose a patient with pulmonary hypertension at 36 weeks, you really, really have to uh, carefully uh, ask the question whether this is a flow-driven phenomena or is more likely to be PVR-driven because it's not uncommon at all to have a flow-driven pulmonary hypertension in this patient population. Um, the other thing to think about is that this, this is not, this is very unlike acute pulmonary hypertension where the PVR either fails to drop down at birth or suddenly goes up because, for example, pulmonary hemorrhage sepsis. This is a slow much a little bit lower, but slow and sustained exposure to high pulmonary muscular resistance. And the symptomology is completely different than, than what you will see in, for example, acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis, where VQ mismatch and acidosis and all that comes through. Uh, in chronic pulmonary hypertension, that's not the clinical symptom that you're going to see, um, because this is a slow and progressive increase, which is uh, more slower exposure. You don't get VQ mismatch, acidosis, hypoxemia, and all those 
acute hypoxemic feature. That's so usually the end stage in, in chronic pulmonary hypertension. What you typically get is symptoms associated with a chronic increase in hydrostatic pressure in the lung vasculature, which typically produces pulmonary edema and interstitial edema, which will then cause reduction in lung compliance. It will increase alveolar capillary distance and this fluid buildup will then produce this, this, this uh, respiratory symptoms which are uh, worsening after a, after a period of time or getting stuck, not improving as you expected. Um, and, and, and that's why these patients are often missed or these patients are extremely hard to pick because they are not changing suddenly um, with hypoxemia. Um, the another interest, interesting fact is that the edema in chronic pulmonary hypertension itself worsens the chronic pulmonary hypertension. And that's a really important concept to remember because what happens is when you have fluid leak out in the interstitium, um, uh, uh, this fluid then as it builds up after a period of time will push back on the on the uh, on the uh, blood vessel itself and when it pushes back it compresses the blood vessels it reduces the net um, uh, blood vascular area available for for circulation so the blood get redistributed in a smaller vascular compartment which will further increase the the the, the pressure inside the vessels because now you have same volume but less compartment so it sort of enters a vicious cycle where a chronic uh, presence of increased hydrostatic pressure causes the fluid to leak out in the interstitium. And this interstitial fluid will push, will then obliterate some of the blood vessels, further increase uh, the, 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 the pressure in the lung. And that's really important to, to understand. Sorry, Amy, am I going over time? Just a few more minutes. Feel free to stop me and I'll then quickly to go to my last slide. Um, so, um, the other thing to think about uh, when you're looking out of these kids is the upstream effect on the right ventricle. Now, I'm not going to go into detail of this in the interest of time, but a right ventricle adaptation is a key uh, in chronic pulmonary hypertension. Your right ventricle may become hypertrophied, a bit dilated, and a hypertrophy is a good adaptation where the wall stress, which is, uh, remains low, and the RV can, can sustain for a much longer period of time. But in our experience, in preterm infant particularly, they tend to vasodilate a lot more rather than hypertrophy. And vasodilatation in the right ventricle, or sorry, not vasodilatation, dilatation of the right ventricle is actually a poor adaptation. It is still adaptation because they're trying to maintain their cardiac output despite having high afterload, but it actually increases the wall stress quite a bit. And these patients have high, uh, expected to have uh, pulmonary edema more and high central venous pressure. And eventually the last phenotype is the RV failure. And to be in mind, our experience once you reach that stage where the RV systolic performance goes down dramatically and the right ventricle output goes down dramatically, these patients so far have not seen them come back from chronic pulmonary hypertension despite no matter um, despite the managements um, so in summary symptoms of chronic pulmonary hypertension are mediated by pulmonary edema pulmonary edema itself will worsen chronic pulmonary hypertension and right ventricle dilatation is a sign of congestive cardiac failure which is basically associated with pulmonary edema and we have to remember that when we are looking at our echo reports um, so what should constitute significant pulmonary hypertension in this patient population at this time we don't really know but if you ask all of us, we all think that the patients who are clinically symptomatic are the patient that we should call as significant pulmonary hypertension for management. The trouble is, how do you define these clinical symptoms? And this is a list of um, uh, symptoms from Wikipedia, actually. And it's, 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 this disorder is called pulmonary heart disease, um, or another name for it is pulmonary heart disease. And the symptoms of chronic pulmonary hypertension in the presence of RV dilatation are purely respiratory. Um, and these symptoms are either or signs are either impossible to assess in that patient population or there's a massive overlap with the symptoms of BPD itself. Um, so how do you distinguish a patient who is symptomatic pulmonary hypertension versus a patient whose symptoms are primarily driven by the parenchymal component of lung disease and pulmonary hypertension that we're diagnosing on echo is just a asymptomatic coexistence. That's really hard. Um, so what um, and what makes it even more harder is the variability in phenotype. Does not every patient with the same uh, same pulmonary pressures will not have the same symptoms. Some patients uh, tolerate it better because they have uh, a, a better remodeling uh, and they are protected against edema, or their RV is better uh, or more designed, or their lung disease itself is not as bad and they are able to cope with the excess flow better. On the other hand, another patient with very reduced pulmonary vascular compartment uh, might not tolerate even slight increase in in pulmonary blood flow. So. That variability in phenotype, despite having same echo findings, makes it hard for clinicians to, to select the patient population. So what we have decided to do in our unit is basically use right ventral dilatation as a threshold for, for identifying these patients. And that really is because we went for specificity. 
rather than sensitivity. So if you pay, if an RV you need a patient diagnosed with RV with pulmonary hypertension, chronic pulmonary hypertension, but the RV is normal in size and performing well, we won't actively treat it for pulmonary hypertension. We'll optimize the respiratory business, but we will very closely follow up. And a lot of these patients actually resolve without progressing into RV dilatation, and those patients will be not treated by any uh, pharmacological means. On the other hand, the patient who develop RV dilatation at the first sign of that happening, we will start uh, treating them more aggressively. Uh, to try and reverse. And what's another thing we try and do is we before we start treatment, we define the symptom. If the symptom is worsening of respiratory symptoms which, or respiratory state, that makes it easy because we know the patient is worsened and there's no other etiology. So that becomes easy that, to, to reverse that. But when the symptoms is failure of expected improvement, that makes it hard because then you are always guessing yourself that maybe the failure, failure is just a delay of BPD resolution versus actually chronic pulmonary hypertension taking over the symptomology. So we are constantly asking that question. Uh, as I said, we use diuretics uh, as our first line approach for pulmonary hypertension management. And that really is because we want to take away the, the, this vicious cycle, break this vicious cycle of pulmonary edema and CPH constantly happening. And I'll just show you the same case that I showed in the beginning, that baby who uh, had escalated respiratory support and we diagnosed the RV dilatation and pulmonary hypertension, we give him diuretics. And in two days, the FIO2 came back down to room air, uh, which was about 30% at the time in the giving. And what was very interesting to us is that the echo finding changed. And this is only about five days after. Um, you can see the RV up here dilated and flat septum. And this is the same patient, five, six, five days of dilated therapy. The RV is still dilated, but the septum become much more rounded and, and, and systole, suggesting that the pulmonary pressures have gone down. And we suspect that went down because we took away the addition contribution of the pulmonary edema uh, itself. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into the whole detail of this, but in our institute um, and, and uh, based on our experience so far, we came up with this particular algorithm of management. Essentially, the key five things are we are scanning everybody who's in respiratory support at 36 weeks and obtaining a baseline NP pro VNP. Um, and if they have mild dilatation of the RV, which is Z score less than three, <coughs> or their known symptoms are not severe, we're just going to watch them and closely observe them for any worsening. On the other hand, those who have uh, a RV dilatation or their symptoms suggest congestive heart failure, which basically is peripheral edema, excessive weight gain, and then we will actually treat them with diuretic therapy. And then again, repeat anti, uh, sorry, anti pro BNP and echo in seven, 14 days. If they come, and a lot of them will just improve. We, we, we don't end up escalating to any pulmonary vasodilatory therapies. They will improve, their pulmonary hypertension will come down, symptom will improve, and then we will be able to maintain them on a um, on diuretic till the CPH completely uh, resolves. And some of them actually go home on diuretic for a couple of months and cardiology follow-up. And, and a small number of patients where despite diuretic, the symptoms persist or worsens, uh, they end up going on, on, on pulmonary vasodilatory therapy, which in our unit and like most units, sildenafil is the first line that we actually end up using. But to be honest, we've used sildenafil not more than two or three times in a year in this patient population ever since we start doing this more systematically. Uh, we did uh, publish our, uh, our, our, our data and basically we, what we found with the, in our patient population, the patient with CPH and CBPD had same outcomes as patient with CPH without DPD. It's a very, very pallid data and doesn't really mean that what we know what we're doing, but it seems to be that our patient are doing all right. Um, we're never going to take away the effect of BPD itself. We also did some echo study and confirmed that pre and post diuretic, their pulmonary arterial pressure actually comes down, just confirming what we saw qualitatively on the, on the scan. Um, I'm going to skip this, uh, uh, um, or I'm going to skim this two, three quickly, but just to tell everybody, there are guidelines existing right now where you can go and examine and see what the expert panel is saying, and they have specifically mentioned screening for, for pH in all patients with BPD. Um, and again, as you can see here, their first line management is usually to, uh, you know, avoid hypoxemia, um, as, uh, assess for aspiration, structural liver disease, respiratory support, and if after that patients don't improve, their recommendation is to, to proceed with the ideal cardiac catheterization to confirm disease severity and other uh, uh, contributing factor. Or uh, more recently, they're saying to start uh, pulmonary vasodilator therapy. And those who don't improve with pulmonary vasodilator therapy, you must consider cardiac catheterization because um, you know those patients may have LV diastolic dysfunction or pulmonary venous stenosis for that means. Um, European uh, network has some, something similar to what we do in Sinai. They basically said, uh, ventilate pH friendly ventilation strategies and diuretics. And if after that things don't improve uh, or worsens, then you consider uh, sildenafil. And more recently, they have given another um, version of the same 
again, saying the same thing, optimize respiratory strategy, diuretics, no improvement or anti-pro BNP worsening and patient worsening or echo worsening, then um, sildenafil still worsening, then they're saying second line, they have to consider cardiac catheterization before we go second line agents. And I will strongly recommend that um, before we go on to Bosantin and, and, and other second line agents. But it seems to be fair to try one first line agent in what you appears to be a, a pulmonary hypertension in the absence of any other echo findings of any other pathology. Um, as I said, the diagnostic criteria is a major challenge for right now. We actually use this, uh, or consistently use this flat septum. It is, um, it is good, it is uh, specific at 36 weeks, but really lacks sensitivity for early diagnosis. So we right now are, we have finished recruitment for a very large study where we recruit 30, 50, 50 patients, where we are trying to define early diagnostic criteria on the echo uh, for early diagnosis of pulmonary vascular disease in preterm infants. So hopefully in the next year or so, we should be able to um, get these data out and be able to uh, identify these patients with significant pulmonary vascular disease in the first three weeks of life itself. So more to follow on that. And that I'll just acknowledge all the contribution of my mentors, my collaborators, and my trainees who have participated with me in the CPS studies. Um, and I would be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, we are going to move on to our last talk of the week, uh, just as a reminder to put any questions in the Q&A, um, because we will get to that next after Dr. Reagan Giesinger, a staff neonatologist and director of neonatal hemodynamics at the University of Iowa, um, gives us her last talk on approach to the hypotensive infant. Amy, do you see one slide or the slideshow view? It looks perfect. Okay, great. So thank you very much for having me. And um, I am uh, excited and daunted to go last after this big crew of big names. But um, I'm going to try and build off of some of the talks that people have uh, given before and talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the practical aspects of dealing with the, the clinical questions about blood pressure and blood pressure support. So first off, I just want to reiterate a couple of the points that uh, Dr. Dempsey made, and that is that it's really, really important as a premise for all talks about blood pressure and all considerations about treatment to remember that blood pressure is one piece of a big uh, system. And all of these things have to go together as one big puzzle in order to give you perspective on the whole of the baby. And if any one aspect of this is abnormal, all of these puzzle pieces being the same size and relatively equally weighted in most situations, that's a red flag for a need for further assessment. But blood pressure itself is a symptom and not in and of itself a diagnosis. One of the other things that we need to remember is that we all do this every day and we have to trust that our instincts about a, a sick baby reflect a sick baby. And so when you are called to the bedside and you go and assess the baby, regardless of what the blood pressure numbers or the heart rate numbers or any other numbers tell you, if a baby looks bad, they're probably sick and every assessment piece that we have has confounders. And just to reiterate this point that uh, Dr. Dempsey already made, blood pressure and flow are not equal to each other. And we've all probably seen this graph before, but it's important to remember that you can have babies with low flow who have normal blood pressure, you have babies with normal flow who have low blood pressure, and then you have groups that match. So in the end, what we end up with is three types of babies. We end up with well babies who have low blood pressure, but good flow. And they need to be observed and can be tough to identify because their numbers are low and it feels compelling to do something about it. We have sick babies who have low blood pressure and low flow. These babies are usually really easy to identify because their numbers are low and they look bad. And we have sick babies with normal blood pressure or even high blood pressure who have low flow. And these babies need to be treated, but they can actually be pretty tough to identify because their numbers look okay. And Importantly, this is a group that we really need to not forget about because these are babies who have an afterload problem and afterload is one of the most common diseases of neonatology, particularly of preterm infants. So here's just a quick cautionary tale to highlight this. This is a 24 weeker who, 25 weeker who was eight hours old 
and she was born after spontaneous preterm labor and c-section for breech presentation she was on like standard starting settings at the university of iowa jet uh, with a relatively low rate, a low PEEP, a low FiO2, and a bit of a metabolic acidosis after her kind of transport in from the outside. And her monitor, this is an epic screen grab on the right, uh, shows a heart rate in the normal range and blood pressures of 40 to 50 over 30s, with means in the high, mean, uh, high 30s. We were asked to see this baby because, number one, she's a preterm infant. Number two, she was outborn. Number three, she had metabolic acidosis. And what we found was uh, this short axis on the left here. This is a picture with the right ventricle as Emma showed you on the top and the left ventricle on the bottom. And you can see that the RV free wall is doing basically nothing. Now, when we look at the numbers that represent the objective measurements of her heart function and cardiac output, her left ventricular output was 50% of what it should be, and her right ventricular output was only 16 mils per kilo per minute. Um, and this represents really severe uh, systolic RV dysfunction, um, basically related to HIE in this situation. But her blood pressure was being maintained because the baby was vasoconstricting herself to maintain organ perfusion pressure. And this is the adaptation that all babies do until they can't. So there's really important caveats to the blood pressure story, and we've already been through what all the normative data is and where it comes from, yeah, from a very thorough literature review. But what's from a practical perspective important is that population data is not your baby. So if you know what your baby's usual is, you really have to make sure that you think about deviations from that uh, in order to um, remember that the baby has changed. And having an internal control, as anybody who's done pre and post research has shown, uh, is one of the best ways to identify uh, differences uh, with the highest um, degree of uh, accuracy with a small sample size. We also know that, as uh, Jean mentioned, which is only studied in the first 72 hours really in detail, but it goes up in general by gestation and chronologic age. And most babies by day three have a mean blood pressure greater than 30, um, if you don't consider kind of the 22 and 23 co week cohort, which we really know very little about. The other thing that's really important from a practical perspective is that many of the preterm infants that we're evaluating or term infants in some situations may have significant uh, ductal shunt. And this is particularly relevant for that, oops, that early baby who we've all seen them in the first four hours, they're born, they get their uh, intubation, they get their surfactant, and immediately thereafter their blood pressure is low, but they look pretty good. So this oftentimes happens because there is escalating left to right shunt through the PDA and the umbilical arterial catheter is postductal, whereas uh, the blood supply to the brain and the left ventricular output are preductal. And so this may actually lead to a difference in our ability to detect perfusion pressure to the brain because significant left to right ductal shunt may actually underestimate perfusion pressure of the UAC, and significant right to left ductal shunt may overestimate perfusion pressure to the UAC. And we're slowly accumulating evidence that um, this is a true phenomenon. So when we're thinking about blood pressure, we talk about mean, but there's much more information than that that we can actually glean. So the systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure can be used to help us better understand our patients. First off, the systolic blood pressure is the force exerted on the wall of the vessel in systole. And so that primarily reflects, it's not equal to, but reflects cardiac output. In contrast, the diastolic pressure is the resting pressure on the blood vessels when the aortic valve and pulmonary valve, but primarily the aortic valve is closed. So this, re this reflects a combination of diastolic tone and vascular size in general, vascular body. The mean blood pressure is simply a time-weighted average of these pressure values in the large systemic arteries. And so when we're using this information practically, we can uh, evaluate different information depending on which component of blood pressure is low. The diastolic blood pressure is the most straightforward. More radius, 
equals less pressure. If you put blood into a bathtub versus into a thimble, there's going to be a lot more pressure on the sides of the thimble than the bathtub. So anything that makes the blood vessels big will make your diastolic low. This includes systemic inflammatory response. We've all seen this with neck. Uh, if you give a lot of anti-epileptic medications to a baby, uh, that will result in uh, low diastolic pressure. And then PDA classically causes low diastolic pressure, particularly early, because when the aortic valve is closed, you're filling not only the systemic circulation, but the pulmonary circulation too. Um, and so uh, this can be true in other kinds of zebra diseases, but PDA is our most common uh, shunt where we might see this. Sometimes hypovolemia causes low diastolic pressure, but in most babies, the kidneys are rapidly adapt to hypovolemia by sending vasoconstricting signals, and therefore hypovolemia primarily clinically manifests as low cardiac output. The systolic blood pressure is a little bit more complicated, but basically anything that, re that results in low cardiac output, be it by reducing the amount of blood coming out of the heart, reducing the force of the heart's con contraction, or increasing the pressure that the heart is contracting against, thereby reducing the amount of blood that's able to leave the heart via afterload, results in low cardiac output. And so I won't go through in detail all of these different contributors, but you can kind of imagine that um, pulmonary hypertension can do it because it fills the left heart less. Obviously, congenital heart disease will do it. Uh, PDA ligation will result in a high afterload. And so the heart, when it contracts, it doesn't generate enough pressure to get all of the blood out and some blood is left behind, resulting in low cardiac output state. So um, I don't know that this has been talked about yet in this session, but I think this has definitely been talked about this week. Um, afterload is a really, really important concept for uh, neonatology. And when we look at the relationship between the amount of pressure the heart is pumping against on or uh, afterload on the x-axis here versus the force of contractility on the y-axis, what you can see when you compare the neonate to the adult is that there's a much uh, steeper decrement in contractility with increasing afterload for the neonate than there is for the adult. And what that is because of is that the, the neonate doesn't have as much um, contractile tissue and doesn't have the tissue organization to be able to mount increased contractility in response to higher pressure to pump against. And so, um, what ends up happening is the ventricle can't generate enough force for the blood uh, to leave the uh, cavity and therefore not enough blood will go forward. The Frank Starling concept is one that I'm sure that we're all familiar with also. In a normal adult, as you stretch the myocytes more, you get a greater elastic recoil. And so you actually gain a greater amount of contractility by putting more volume into the atrium and the ventricle um, up to a certain point uh, than you gain simply by the amount of volume that you put in there. So you actually get a proportional improvement in your stroke volume um, on the basis of greater stretch. Uh, the near-term fetal lamb is the best model that we have for this. And really what you can see on the graph on the right is that if you're at really low mean atrial pressure, you will get an increase in stroke volume proportional to your increase in filling pressure. But once you get beyond kind of full, um, you really don't get uh, much more bang for your buck with that. More blood in means more blood out simply because there's more blood in and not because there's a greater contraction on the basis of the Frank Starling. Uh, law. So we often talk about volume as a treatment for low blood pressure. Um, I think we have to take a little bit of a step back from that and think about um, what does volume really do uh, in the absence of hemorrhage or dehydration. So if you know your baby has had an acute hemorrhage, volume is the right thing to do, absolutely, and you should keep doing that until the baby is filled. Um, but if that history isn't there, or if that hasn't happened, it's important to think about what volume is actually going to do. So in um, normal volemic animal models, there's been no change in blood pressure on the basis of a bolus of crystalloid, probably related to the fact that the Frank-Starling um, curve is not uh, being activated. 
in babies, there are small and inconsistent studies. And when there's inconsistent studies, it tells us that we don't really know, uh, or our population is heterogeneous. And it's probably both um, in this situation. So the reality uh, of volume for non-hypovolemic patients is probably that a little is good, but a lot um, is not better. And the reason a little might be good is if we don't really know where we are on the Frank Starling curve, it's good to get onto the full part, uh, but more does not necessarily make things better. And more might give you more third spacing, um, as we know with albumin, which increases fluid retention and causes impaired gas exchange. Uh, the three jobs for fluid boluses um, are uh, important ones to remember, though, because there are caveats to this. Um, one, as I mentioned, if you know you're hypovolemic, fair enough. Uh, number two, if you don't know where you are, or if you don't know uh, that you're not having a lot of capillary leak, giving fluid as an initial uh, therapy is very reasonable and can help you identify where you are and help you bridge to more definitive therapies. And if your ventricle is not working at all, so you have completely dysfunctional RV and pulmonary hypertension, for example, or a baby with HIE and severe transient myocardial ischemia, mm -hmm. forcing blood to move with a bolus may be the only way to deliver more circulation and deliver your cardiovascular drugs to the circulation. But remembering that that's an extremely short-term solution and remembering that edema is not volume overload. So we have to remember to keep those separate. So now kind of a simple and practical approach to the cardiovascular drugs. We often talk about these two things as synonymous, but they're not. There are inotropes and there are vasopressors. And then there are drugs that are a combination of both. And it's really important when we're trying to think about the mechanism and which drugs to choose for which situations that we remember the properties of these so that we can choose a drug that makes logical biological sense. These are the receptors uh, of the catecholamine system. I'm not going to belabor this because it's a long time since we all had to me memorize this for medical school. But basically, the location that the drug has its primary effect is what drives whether it's an inotrope or a vasopressor. Things that affect the catecholamine receptors in the heart are primarily inotropes. Things that affect the alpha receptors in particular in the peripheral vasculature are primarily vasopressors. And then the beta-2 receptor is uh, on vascular smooth muscle and it's a vasodilator. So it kind of doesn't fit with treatment of blood pressure, but we will talk about it a little bit. Dobutamine is the simplest medication because the actions in the vessels largely cancel out. So what we end up with is alpha-1 activity, both in the heart and the peripheral vasculature, so increasing the force of contraction and vasoconstriction, but also beta-1 and beta-2 activity, which in the heart is positively contractile and results in the tachycardia that you oftentimes see with particularly high doses of dobutamine. But in the peripheral vasculature, these effects cancel each other out. And People talk in the literature sometimes about kind of a vasodilatory effect of dobutamine. We don't see that very often in neonates, particularly in preterm neonates, partly because uh, the receptor system of the uh, preterm neonate, the alpha receptors actually develop first in terms of ontogeny, and then the beta receptors develop second. So you get primarily an alpha response uh, if there is an alpha receptor involved in the mechanism of the medication. And we'll see that again with norepinephrine. So here are the pharmacotherapy options that we commonly use. Of course, there are a lot of other ones that we could use, but these are the ones that most neonatologists are familiar with. We have inotropes, dobutamine, which I already mentioned, and maybe in some situations, milrinone. Uh, we have vasopressors, dopamine, usually, I'll talk about that in a second, vasopressin and norepinephrine. And then we have drugs that do both, epinephrine and hydrocortisone. So I'll just finish up the inotropes first. Um, milrinone, basically you can think of it as a vasodilator of everything at every site that it does. And it does this by inhibiting uh, phosphodiesterase 3, increasing cyclic AMP, and therefore creating vasodilation in the vascular smooth muscle cell, both in the pulmonary side and the systemic side. It's been shown to be effective in a number of different pathologies. Uh, and it's been shown to uh, reduce blood pressure, 
increase uh, uh, pulmonary or increase oxygenation uh, efficacy in pulmonary hypertension and improve heart function. Probably the primary mechanism by which it improves heart function is via reduction in afterload. Uh, because the mechanism that it works on the myocyte is through the sarcolemma, which are not mature in a lot of our patients. But either way, um, it results in forward uh, motion of blood into both the systemic and pulmonary circulation, which is what we want in a lot of situations. Importantly, it has a pretty long half-life for these medications, uh, especially in preterm infants. And we really shouldn't be giving it to babies who already have diastolic or mean blood pressures that are low. And this is because we know it's going to vasodilate and therefore we know it's going to reduce blood pressure further. So you have to use something else to fix the blood pressure before you use this to fix the afterload or fix the heart function. Yeah, but it's a good drug uh, to use in a lot of situations. On to e old dopamine. So dopamine has been mentioned quite a number of times already today. Um, and I'm just going to show you this one particular very uh, interesting but small study that profiles the effects of dopamine and underpins the reason why it might not be the right thing to pick in a lot of particularly preterm infants. So this is a small group uh, of 14 babies that were about 26, 27 weeks, where people measured their uh, cardiac output and their blood pressure before and after dopamine at a dose of between six and eight mics per kilo per minute. And what you can see, which is pretty low dose, what you can see is that there are two primary patterns. In the green boxes, there are babies whose blood pressure went up and their cardiac output went up a little bit. But in the red boxes, there are babies whose blood pressure went up a lot and their cardiac output went down. Importantly, there's very little difference between these two groups of babies clinically, and we don't really know which baby is going to be in which category. And this may be related, as I mentioned before, to the predominance of the alpha receptor development. Um, we don't know that, uh, but it could also be related to the fact that 50% of dopamine's action is via conversion to norepinephrine, and those enzyme systems are not necessarily mature in all neonates. So when you're giving a medication which is meant to increase blood pressure and your heart function is good, dopamine may be a very reasonable drug to give. But if you don't know that your heart function is good and you might get increase in afterload without increase in cardiac output, that's a bit risky. Um, and um, so you have to be selecting the right population of babies. This is a very nice randomized trial, one of very few that we have in neonatal cardiovascular medicine, where babies were uh, given um, either dobutamine or dopamine in a crossover style and evaluated for their SVC flow before and after. And what you can see is that dopamine increases blood pressure, but there's a lot of straight lines in terms of before and after SVC flow, so it might not increase cardiac output, whereas dobutamine increases cardiac output but might not increase blood pressure. And so the numbers might not change, but the baby may actually get better. So we really need to be thinking about the population in order to best select who we're going to give these two drugs to. Vasopressin is kind of the quintessential vasoconstrictor that we talk about. It's a hormone that its job in the body is to protect us from the effects of acute hemorrhage. It does so by two mechanisms, one through the V1 receptors, which mediate vasoconstriction if they're um, located on the vascular smooth muscle cell via calcium release, and uh, they mediate vasodilation if they're located on the endothelial cell by increasing nitric oxide. And this is important because this dictates the balance of where the V1 receptors are, dictates the balance in each vascular bed of whether vasopressin is primarily a vasoconstrictor or less so of a vasoconstrictor or a vasodilator. And so in the splanchnic circulation and the skin and various other places that are not part of the fight or flight response, uh, vasoconstriction happens because the receptors are on the vascular smooth muscle cell, whereas in places like the lung, the coronary, and the brain, there are endothelial receptors for vasopressin, and therefore there is a relative vasodilation in comparison to what it does in the splanchnic circulation. Vasopressin has been shown as an effective rescue therapy for pulmonary hypertension in hypoxic neonates uh, that are refractory to nitric oxide, and we use it in acute pulmonary hypertension all the time as a, as a result of this very favorable profile. 
The important thing to remember about vasopressin, though, is there's that troublesome V2 receptor, which is located in the collecting duct of the kidney and results in water reabsorption. And so if your baby is oliguric on vasopressin, it's very likely that that baby is becoming dilute because of too much fluid and not enough urine output, basically by creating SIADH. The other thing, though, is that vasopressin is a potent natriuretic because the kidney, again, adapts by secreting sodium and chloride more proximally in the kidney, and that way tries to get rid of water that way. And so if you're not oliguric on uh, vasopressin, then it's likely that you're peeing out a lot of salt. Either way, hyponatremia is a really important side effect and needs to be monitored for uh, and anticipated. An alternative agent is norepinephrine, and we're back to the receptors again. Basically, norepinephrine is dobutamine plus a factory for norepinephrine by stimulating the alpha-2 receptor. So it has a small uh, positive inotrope effect by binding in the heart, but it also binds very potently to alpha-2 receptors on the presynaptic terminal, resulting in more and more and more norepinephrine release. And as a result of that, it's a very potent alpha agonist with high affinity binding and results in vasoconstriction very potently. The evidence that we have for the use of norepinephrine in neonates specifically is relatively sparse. Uh, these are two of the studies uh, that use norepinephrine in septic shock, showing, I'm almost finished, Amy, um, showing an increase in blood pressure in 22 term and 30 preterm patients. Uh, so it effectively increases blood pressure as that makes sense. And its use in pulmonary hypertension is another uh, thing that is talked about. Um, and this is one study that actually shows 18 term infants with acute pulmonary hypertension who have uh, some improvement in FiO2 and blood pressure after treatment with norepinephrine. Important to know, though, these babies were only in 50% oxygen, um, and therefore they were not very sick. And also their mean air, uh, their pulmonary artery pressure was actually uh, increased in the presence of norepinephrine. And so although this study shows improvement, I think we have to think about it with, with caution, particularly in the baby with hypoxemic respiratory failure. This is a this is two uh, distinct studies. The one on the left is an animal study showing a substantial increase in pulmonary vascular tone with 100% oxygen at increasing doses of norepinephrine. And the one on the right is an adult study showing changes in pulmonary vascular and systemic vascular tone, systemic vascular resistance on the top, uh, pulmonary on the bottom, with a comparison treatment of either telorepressin, so vasopressin analog, or norepinephrine. And what this shows is with milrinone, uh, after melanone treatment in these patients, uh, blood pressure went down, and so did pulmonary and systemic vascular tone, as expected. Uh, in the telorepressin group, it stayed down. In the norepinephrine group, it went back up again. So just caution in babies who have um, hypoxemic respiratory failure when thinking about norepinephrine versus vasopressin. Epinephrine basically does everything. At low dose, it's probably more inotropic. At high dose, it's probably more combined. And basically, it's just a more potent version of a stimulator at all the um, sites. This is the mechanism or the multiple mechanisms of hydrocortisone. I'm not going to go through all of these. Number one, because I don't have time. Number two, because it's not really relevant. But basically, there are many, many, many mechanisms but most of them are slow. And so hydrocortisone is a very good adjunct of therapy to put more receptors on the cell surface, but those are cytosolic processes that actually take some time. And so if you need something to work now, um, hydrocortisone might, be not, might not be your most appropriate first line agent. So I'm just gonna skip a couple of things and show you my final table here. And the message of this is just to say that it's not, it's not necessarily important to memorize the each individual action of each individual medication. What you really wanna know is what is the advantage of each one? What is the downside of each one? And choose your first line agent correspondingly when you're thinking about the cause of your disease. So if you need a vasopressor, you have dopamine, norepinephrine, or vasopressin. If you have pulmonary hypertension, you probably don't want dopamine because it increases pulmonary vascular resistance. We didn't go through that in detail here, but um, that's one of its uh, major uh, problems. 
Uh, you might want norepinephrine, you might want vasopressin, but you're thinking in the background about the sodium, about tachycardia, about a little bit of pulmonary vasoconstriction in 100% oxygen. If you're deciding about a positive inotrope, you want something that either increases, doesn't change, or is okay to decrease blood pressure. And that's how you can think about choosing between dobutamine, milrinone, and epinephrine. So in the end, this is a very complicated scheme. And just to go very back to the beginning and what uh, Dr. Dempsey was saying, blood pressure is not one thing. Uh, putting it in the context of the clinical situation is really, really, really important. By using the components of blood pressure, you can get more information about what might be causing the problem. And once you figure out the pathophysiology, there are logical first and second line therapies. And if you choose something and it either makes your baby worse, is associated with worsening, or doesn't make the baby better, wonder about whether you chose an inappropriate medication, you have the wrong physiology, or it's not being delivered. And have some humbleness to stop things that are not helping you um, if the baby is getting worse. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to participate in the panel and take any questions you have. All right, thank you very much, Reagan. I invite all of the panelists to um, put their videos back on. I do think Patrick has one thing he would like to share first before we get into a brief question and answer period since we ran a little bit long. Yeah, Amy, I just I just wanted to publicly on behalf of this group here acknowledge John Cleary who passed away this week. You know, John was a tremendous advocate for cardiovascular physiology, the, one of the co-founders of NeoHeart, and certainly all members of the panel here have had a close interface with John. And I just wanted to make sure that we had acknowledged him here. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. And um, I think.